Well, we're in part gazillion of Faith University. We've been in it so long, I forgot what part we're on. So in the words of DJ Khaled, this is another one. This is another one. Uh, <laughs> so I want to read a few verses of scripture uh, in Mark chapter 5, verse number 24. Mark chapter 5, verse number 24. Good to see the Golden Girls. Yeah, we, we got a group of, uh, th these are founding members. They're a group of strong sisters in our church. We call them the Golden Girls. And we, we got uh, some of y'all who are like 30 and under. you like, what's a Golden Girl? Just Google it. That's all I can tell you. Mark chapter 5, verse 24 says, So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And the woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway or immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. At once Jesus realized power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? You see the people crowding you, the disciples answered, and yet you ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from this plague. I want to give you the title of this topic. Let me pause for the calls as a pastor. Let me be a pastor now. I'm some of your preacher. I'm some of your pastor. Let me be a pastor now and say, I want to thank those of you and congratulate you for your consistency in this series. If God is finishing this year building your faith, it means, did you hear what I just said? If God is spending this year building your faith, he's building your faith in 2021 for what you getting ready to build in 2022. See, somebody didn't, somebody received that as a word. I said, if he's spending the rest of this year building your faith, it's because you're going to need it for what he's going to use you to build in 2022. Man, that's why I, I want to encourage you to stay locked in, to stay, to stay consistent. I know this pandemic is throwing a lot of people off, but it should be some rhythms that are sacred. It should be some sacred rhythms. It should be some stuff in your life that's untouchable. And God should be at the top of the list. Don't play with me and my Jesus. I need him. Sundays are for Jesus. So I want to talk from this subject in our time together. Part gazillion. Here it is. I'm tired of this. <laughs> Clap your hands if you're in expectation of God's word. I want to begin my time today by informing some and reminding others of an axiom that I articulated often early in ministry. The axiom can be captured in the following phrase. If you're a note taker, if you're a communicator in the chat, I want you to put this axiom for the edification of your brothers and sisters. Here it is. Frustration is your friend. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Frustration is your friend. I know that frustration produces a degree and a dimension of agitation. But I'm telling you that without frustration, you would never change your location. Frustration is your friend. Frustration is an emotion that God uses to inform us that something is out of alignment. It is consistent. It is incessant. It won't let us make states out of what God wants to be a stage. 
Frustration is our friend. It is the fuel that enables and empowers us to break patterns and protocols that are actually imprisoning us instead of advancing us. Frustration is our friend. It is the sick and tired that makes us sick and tired of sick and tired. So I want to pause for the cause and say something that might be initially confusing, but hopefully it's eventually edifying. And that is, if you are watching this message, if you are seated in this space here in New Jersey and you are dealing with a degree and a dimension of frustration, Dr. Darius Daniels wants to say two words to you. I'm glad. I'm glad. If you're frustrated emotionally, I'm glad. If you're frustrated relationally, I'm glad. If you're frustrated professionally, I'm glad. If you're frustrated financially, I'm glad. I'm glad because God is getting ready to use your frustration to produce some elevation in your life. If it were not for the frustration, you would settle for average, ordinary, and mediocrity. But God has to stir your nest to push you out of your places and your prism of comfortability so that you can step into a season of the uncommon and the unusual. And I want to know, am I talking to anybody today that says, I sense uncommon? Come on, I'm going to say it again. Am I talking to anybody today that says, I sense the uncommon? I'm starting to get allergic to average. Things I used to be okay with, I'm not okay with anymore. Other people are observing my life from the outside and saying I should be satisfied. Some people are jealous of where I am and I can't stand where I am. I'm frustrated and I'm telling somebody God is using frustration to produce some elevation in your life. Did you hear what I said? I'm working on this on this book and it's this book on purpose and uh, it's coming out next year and it's, and it's going to be dealing with I've never seen purpose is the most conf- is the subject that people are the most confused about and I'm like this is the one thing you can't be confused about you, you, you can't be con- or, not can't but I don't want you to be confused about why you're born you can be confused about what shoes you want to wear you can be confused about what job you want to take I don't want you to be confused about why you exist. I don't want you to be confused about how you're supposed to use the life. I don't want your life to be over before you figure out what you're supposed to do with it. And so, and so uh, in this book, I'm working through this rubric and this blueprint that actually my coaching mentor, one of my mentors in coaching, trained me on to kind of help people identify their uniqueness. And like one, one space that everybody is unique in is an area called unique agitation. It means that me and you can walk in the same room. We see the same thing and it bother you and not bother me. Come on. Have you ever been in a space and you upset that nobody else is upset? Are y'all going to talk to me at you or do I have to go to work? I I said, have you ever walked into a space and said, y'all not upset? This don't bother you? You okay with this? That's what's called a unique agitation. Because what you are uniquely agitated with, you are assigned to. Don't y'all mess with me this morning. Did you hear what I just said? What you are uniquely, because purpose is an answer to a problem. And so God has to uniquely agitate you with the problems you've been born to solve. This is why everybody in, in, in the book of 1 Sam, you remember David, David defeated Goliath? But the only reason he fought Goliath was because he had a unique agitation with Goliath. Read the story. David walks up and he hears Uh, Goliath insulting Israel and insulting God and David who's not even in the army looks around at all the people in the army and say y'all okay with this he tweaking you don't hear this he said who is this uncircumcised Philistine 
that dare to defy the armies of the living God. He talking real spicy right now. Everybody else is hearing it and they do nothing about it. Your agitation is your assignment. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So I'm agitated when people are saved and don't change. I'm agitated when people settle for less than God's best for their life. I'm agitated when people are all right, not being all right. Because that's my assignment. Am I making sense? Frustration is our friend. That's what I'm trying to get us to see. And when it is stewarded properly. Okay, when we're frustrated, I think, <laughs> here's our common tendency. When we're frustrated, can somebody fix my clock? Because y'all know I already go over time. I already don't look at it. Don't submit to it. <laughs> when the clock right, oh, it's still a problem. So please, it's really going to be a problem. We'll be here. We'll be evening service. <laughs> what was I saying? I was getting ready to make a point. Brock, what was I saying? Huh? I still. Somebody tell me what I was saying. Yes. Thank you. Stewing in frustration. Most of the times when we experience a frustration, we try to fix the frustration. You got it. Don't you mess with me. We, we try to fix the frustration instead of fixing what's frustrating. God said, God's like, I got the frustration there not because I want you just to fix the frustration. I got the frustration there because I'm trying to use the frustration to show you what I want to fix. So don't try to get out of it before you realize and recognize what you're supposed to get from it. Frustration is our friend. And I want somebody in this room and somebody that's watching online in the room I want you to say it online I want you to type it I want you to confess this say frustration is my friend it, it, it's my friend 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 and this text here in Mark chapter 5 is an amazing example of what I'm attempting to articulate. In Mark chapter 5, we get access to an experience that Jesus has with an unnamed woman. It is an unnamed woman who literally presses her way through a crowd to get to Jesus. Now, now I, I don't want you to miss this. Jesus is literally on his way to perform a miracle for someone else. I want you to see this now. He is on his way to perform a miracle for a man named Jairus. Jairus was a religious leader whose 12-year-old daughter gets sick. He goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, will you come to my house and lay hands on my 12-year-old daughter? This is again, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, what I call intercessory faith. The daughter cannot believe for herself. But she's got somebody in her life that loves her. That says, Jesus, I want you to use my faith to heal my daughter. Every parent should have said amen there. I said, come on now. She's not in a position where she can believe for you. So until she can believe for herself, I'm going to stand in the gap and say, I want you to use my faith. And some of us, if you're honest and if you audit your life, you got to admit that the reason you are here is because somebody stood in the gap for you. 
and believe God for you until you could believe God for yourself. In accessory faith, and I want to speak this, I feel this prophetically. I want to speak to a parent. And I want to say, you grab a hold metaphorically to the horns of that altar. And you grab a hold to the promises of God. And I want you to have a righteous resilience and a spiritual stubbornness liking unto that of Jacob. Where you say, I will not let you go until you bless my baby. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, come on. I want you to say, I'm speaking a turnaround. You said the fruit of my womb would be blessed. And as long as they got breath in their body, I don't care if they six or 66, they still my child. Your hand is still on their life. The promise of God still remains. I want somebody to praise them for your children right now. Hey, I, I want you to think about the child that's giving you the most heartache and the most heartbreak and I want you to give the devil a nervous breakdown and praise God in advance for your children. Put some fire in that chat. Y'all not, y'all not praising him like you believe he's gonna break the chains of a gang He's going to break the chains of alcoholism, break the chains of bad social relationships, that they're coming back to God, they're coming back to the church. I come against spiritually these thoughts and feelings of parental condemnation. You did all you could do. I come against that. Did you hear me? I said you did all you could do. This is not your fault. You raised them right. Could you have done some things differently? Yes. But nobody parents perfectly. Could, did you give them all you wanted to? No. But did you give them enough to be doing better than they doing? Yes, you did. See, this Holy Ghost preaching right here, this is, this is this not in my notes. You did the best you could. Your parents did good with you and you our parents did good with us and we was crazy too God is a good father and a perfect father and we still don't do what he tell us to do so don't put more pressure on yourself than God put on him Jairus came and said Jesus Heal my baby. This is my daughter. She 12. So Jesus starts walking to Jairus' house. A crowd starts following Jesus. And there's a woman in the crowd who the Bible says has an issue of blood. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that the thing that happens monthly happened regularly for 12 years. Did you hear what I just said? 12 years. Now, I want you to see the implications of this. It has implications in a few areas. First of all, most people aren't aware of the religious implications of this. Because at this period, it's Old Covenant, Old Testament, under the law. Now, we're New Covenant, New Testament. But this was Old Covenant, 
Old Testament under the law, which means religiously you were declared to be unclean. It means you could not go to the synagogue. Did you hear what I just said? So during the season of her life where she needed spiritual support the most, it was that season of her life where she was cut off from the place she could get it from. Not only were there implications religiously, there were implications socially. Because you were considered unclean, anybody that touched you was considered unclean also. So this, this isn't just 12 years of a physical challenge. It's 12 years of quarantine. So let's pause for the cause. Where, not, not just physically, where is she mentally? 12 years of waking up every morning and all you want to do is feel good. 12 years where the only time you get relief is when you sleep. And I know y'all never felt that kind of pain. I'm not just talking about physical, I'm talking about emotionally. You never felt that kind of pain. But some of you who walk through some seasons like what I've walked through, you know what it's like for something to be so excruciating emotionally. You look forward to going to sleep because that's the only time you don't feel. So she's affected spiritually. She's affected relationally. And the text says she's also affected financially. What does it say? It says she spent all she had. And not only did she spend all she had, she went to many physicians. It's nothing more frustrating than going to physician after physician. Talk to me, church. Specialist after specialist. Talk to me in the chat. And, and investing energy and resources and nobody has a remedy. So now she's like, I had a physical problem. That's created a spiritual problem. That's created a relational problem. And now it's created a financial problem. So all I had to worry about at first was what was going on with me physically. But I got to worry about what's going on, with me physic going on with me physically and also what's going on with me spiritually and what's going on with me e relationally and what's going on with me emotionally and what's going on with me with financially. Have you ever felt like if it's not one thing, it's enough. Have you ever felt like, Jesus, all of this can't be happening at the same time? <laughs> like all of this at the same time? Like dealing with one of these is enough. But you want me to deal with all of these at the same time? And some of you may be thinking, I can't relate to this woman literally. I'm telling you, you can relate to her metaphorically. Because everyone may not have had a 12-year cycle literally, but you've had seasons of cycles metaphorically. Did you hear what I just said? Cycles. When time is moving, but you aren't. Cycles. When time is moving and the relationship isn't. It's like this a whole nother year and we still in the same place. Where is my, somebody talk back to me in the chat because <laughs> I'm just trying to find the honest people. I think, right, it's like, wait a minute, this a, this a whole nother year. Why I feel like we're in the same place? What are we doing? <laughs> Respectfully, what are, we, what are we doing? Cycles. Professionally. Cycles. Emotionally. Cycles. And the cycles are frustrating. 
this woman's frustrated. <sighs> Woo. But if it wasn't for her frustration, frustration is your friend. If it wasn't for her frustration, she wouldn't have had the motivation that she needed to experience her transformation. So now, no, because see, y'all don't understand what she had to go through to actually get to him. One, the Bible says there's a crowd of people that's actually following him. So to get to, I'm not going to bother this, but to get to Jesus, she got to get through the crowd. She got to get past people. You got it. Yeah. So watch this. So in a season, in a, excuse me, in a circumstance, in a situation like this, you would think that her motivation would be fueled by support in the form of relationships. But because she's unclean, nobody can tell, nobody can encourage her. There are no text messages during this time. They can't FaceTime her. They can't call her. See, some of you remember those days. Because they weren't too long ago. Huh? When I was in college, I had a beeper. You had to page me. 911 me. I pull over to a payphone, put a quarter in. It's like, what's a pay phone? Just Google it. Just Google it. They couldn't FaceTime her. They couldn't call her. So the text says, she said to herself. She couldn't even get to the synagogue. There was no streaming. So if she didn't get to the synagogue, she couldn't get a word. But she said to herself, when the preacher can't say it to me, when my friends can't say it to me, I need to be able to preach to myself. I need to be able to encourage myself. She said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. And I am telling you, faith will not only cause you to speak to mountains, faith will cause you to talk to yourself. And some people, <laughs> some people will hear that and say, that sounds crazy. I'm telling you the reason some of us have not gone crazy is because we learn how to talk to ourselves. We told ourselves, you getting out of this bed today. We told ourselves you're gonna make it. We told ourselves trouble doesn't last always. We told ourselves weeping may endure for a night, but joy. We said to ourselves, and I'm telling you when nobody will say it to you, you gotta say it to yourself. Faith produces self talk. I'm going to do this. I'm going to break this cycle. I'm going to break this pattern. I'm not too old. I'm not too young. I'm not too white. I'm not too black. I'm not too rich. I'm not too poor. What God has for me, it is for me. Faith makes you talk to yourself. I'm done. She said, if I could touch, this, this, this is the way I read it, Brother Brock, growing up. If I could touch the hem, I really like, I, I think that's a more picturesque portrayal of what's happening here because some historians say Jesus is actually wearing a shawl type garment with certain tassels that are on the hem. So, so, so when she, he, when she said, she said, she says, if I could just touch, this is what's the him. Now she, she didn't say him. She didn't say I need to touch him. She said, I just need to touch what's on him. 
Is there anybody that's got that kind of faith that says, I don't need what everybody else needs. Lord, just get me close. Lord, you don't have to do it for me. Just get me in the room. You don't have to do it for me. Just get me in the door. If I could but touch the hem. Now, I'm not going to bother this too much, but I want you to see the radical, revolutionary nature of this woman and how frustration caused her to push past social and religious protocols that were imprisoning because they weren't ordained by God. See, just because it's religious doesn't mean it's godly. Come on. Just because the church says it doesn't mean God approves of it. Because what you cannot ignore is this woman's frustration driving her to break through some protocols and some norms she would have normally subjected herself to. Because if she's unclean and she touches Jesus, then technically Jesus would be unclean also. Did you hear what I just said? Technically, Jesus would be unclean also, right? But frustration made her push past some traditions that would have stopped her from taking advantage of the power that was available to her. I'm not going to bother this, but I'm going to bother it a little bit. Yes, I am. Did you hear? Sometimes, sometimes to get a miracle, you got to be willing to break a rule. I didn't say break the law. I didn't say do something unbiblical. I'm saying there are rules and norms that we often submit to that are not ordained or endorsed by God. And watch this, and when you break out of those norms, when you don't submit to those protocols, you offend people that you think you need and that they think you need them too. But this woman had tried people because she had gone to doctor after doctor. So she says, I'm willing to be, watch this, I'm willing to be offensive to you if I can be blessed by him. Because I tried you and you couldn't help me. But now I got to look to the hills. From whence comes my help. I got to get to Jesus. Because I tried it your way and I'm still sad. I tried it your way and I'm still bleeding. I tried your church norms and I'm still stuck and stagnant and ineffective and unproductive. Get me to Jesus. Woo! Did you hear what I said? Can you imagine the way people are looking at her? What's she doing? She need to get somewhere and sit down. She needs to have several seats. She wasn't in prison by her anticipation of other people's opinions. Y'all got to understand all the rules she broke. Can you imagine? You know how the disciples were? They were funny acting. They were so funny. Acting. Leave Jesus. Leave us alone. Ain't nobody coming here for you. Don't get it twisted. Okay. Did you hear what I just said? Yep, yep. See, some people can be around people that are in demand and then start assuming they the ones in demand. <laughs> it's like, and, and these people are like, I'm just tolerating you. I'm here for Jesus. I mean, since you were Jesus, I'm nice to you, but I'm here. Is that, is that, not, is that not what they said? Is that, not, is that not what the disciples said when the Syrophoenician woman came and said, hey, my daughter's vexed with the devil? And the, the disciples said, send her away. She crieth after us. She's not crying after you. <laughs> I 
She like, I'm not here for you. I'm being nice to you, but I'm really not here for you. That's why you can you should not be imprisoned by and held hostage by people, and I gotta teach on this too. People who have Jezebel like, which is look at me. Jeze, look at me. In the chat, look at me. Jezebel tendencies are genderless. The biblical character Jezebel is personified in a woman in scripture. But the tendencies of Jezebel are not relegated to the woman. There's a whole lot of men with Jezebel-like tendencies. Don't see, uh-huh, I got my foot on something now. When you lie to a woman for the purpose of getting something from her that she's supposed to give to someone she's in covenant with. That is manipulation, it is control, and it's Jezebel. All right, let me, let me leave that alone. And so there are people in your life who love you, but they still have Jezebel-like tendencies. And many of us are stuck. You're in prison because you don't want to offend somebody that actually loves the version of you that's not the best of you. You don't want me to change, not because you care about me. You don't want me to change because you care about you. And you, you like me this way even if I don't like me this way. It's, it's, it's Jezebel. Why are you mad that I just did something that's best for me? You said you love me. Why aren't you happy for me? She had to push past. I'm done, Chris. She had to push past these attendance, these perceptions and the possibility of offense. And she touches Jesus. And Jesus stopped. And said, who touched me? He stopped because the Bible said, this is what one translation says. It says, he knew that virtue, spiritual energy. <laughs> spiritual energy had gone out of him. He said, who touched me? The disciples say, Jesus You see all these people? Everybody touching you? What? Everybody touching you? He said, no, 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 no. You right, everybody touching me. No, 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 everybody's screaming. No, 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 everybody's clapping. No, 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 everybody's saying amen. No, 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 everybody's leaping and dancing. He said, but when faith do it, it feel different. Y'all not talking to me. Yeah. Say, they touching me because they curious. They touching me because they fanning out. He says, but when faith touched me, faith pulled something out of me without my permission. Y'all missed it. He wasn't even trying to heal her. <laughs> he was going to Jarius' his house. He looked around and said, who touched me? And the Bible says the woman with fear and trembling came to him. 
I said, it's, it's me. And he says these words. I love this. He says to her, first thing he says is, go in peace. He says, he says your faith has made you whole. Then he says, go in peace. He says, you came to me and you didn't have it. I'm telling you, leave with peace. Go, go in peace. Go in peace. He says, your faith has taken care of this thing physically. What I'm doing is giving you a word that's going to take care of you emotionally. Go in peace. And I don't believe that's just God's word for her. As my pastor says, let's build a bridge of contemporization from the text from then to now. I believe that is also Jesus' words to us. Go in peace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this... <laughs> Not just socially, not just physically, not just financially, not just professionally. I want you to, to go in peace emotionally. But none of this would have happened without frustration. If she hadn't said, I'm paraphrasing, I'm tired of this. And I believe God put this word on my heart today because somebody that's watching this and somebody in this room, you where this woman is. In some area of your life, you're saying, I'm tired of this. I know there's more in me. I'm tired of this. I know I've been called and created for more. I'm tired of this. I know I'm supposed to be doing something with my life and I'm not clear on what it is. I'm tired of this. I know, I, I know God created me and made me worthy of love. And I'm tired of dating the same people with different names. I'm tired of this. And my question to you today is will you let that frustration drive you to desperation or will you let that frustration push you to faith? She said, if I could but touch him, this cycle will be broken. And all of us have cycles. I'm thinking about reteaching this. How many of y'all remember when I did a teaching called Bloodlines? You remember that? Some of you remember that? I'm thinking about reteaching a version of that at the beginning of somewhere around the beginning of next year. Because I don't think people understand. We, like we ignore, we all got generational cycles. And here's the thing. If you're not aware of what's going on in your family, you can be operating in a generational cycle and you don't know it's generational. Does that make sense? Like, it's hard to know if you like your dad if you don't know your dad that well. You won't know that this has been going on for three generations if those generations aren't, you aren't in close proximity to them. So something can be a generational cycle and you not even know it's generational. You can be thinking something wrong with you. And all you did was inherit a tendency that was in your bloodline. A cycle that God is calling you to break. to say this stops with this generation did you hear what I just said you should say I'm the last person in my family for the foreseeable future that will have to worry about how to pay for college it breaks with me do you believe that Jesus 
can break whatever cycle you've been in for however long you've been in it. If you tired of it, he can heal you from it. And I'm believing he's getting ready to do that. I got to go, but I sense that God wants to do something. I want you to just right now where you're watching me, I don't care if you're watching me on a phone, on a laptop, or if you're in this room, I want you to sit. Chris is going to sing us into the presence of God, and I believe God's going to start breaking mental chains here. Mental chains. Because you don't get free out there until you get free in here. Come on, just worship the Lord with us. Father, I pray right now for those watching online, those that are in this room, those that have even watched this message on demand. I pray that right now, in the name of Jesus, that you would set your people free from cycles. 12 years, two years, 12 weeks, generational. I pray now in the name of Jesus that what you did for this woman in Mark 5, you do for us right now. Your son set us free. And you said, if the son makes us free, we are free indeed. Thank you. We will go in peace because our faith has made us whole. In Jesus' name, amen. I love your family.